So uh, there's this beautiful scripture when, the, when King David is being selected, when King David is being chosen, that God uh, is talking with Samuel, who is the kingmaker uh, for the first two kings. And he's talking with Samuel, and Samuel's like, oh, it's got to be this guy. And it's because he's so handsome, he's so tall, you know, he looks like he's got to be the one. And God tells Samuel, no, not this one, I've rejected him, that, that, that's not the one. And he's, he's sent to one family, they go through all the sons, and they're like, well, isn't there anybody else? And he finally finds someone who is very unlikely, looks like a little kid, comes stumbling in out of the field from the sheep, that's the one. Now, none of us would have picked David unless we knew David. But none of us could possibly know David as, David as God knew David because God wasn't looking at what he looked like. God didn't look all that, doesn't care, doesn't appear to care all that much about appearances. God looks at the heart. Man does not see what the Lord sees. For man sees what is visible. The Lord looks at the heart. It can be awful easy to get caught up in what is visible. During the staff meeting this week, I told uh, Kylie and Lloyd, who are meeting with us, we, we pray. By the way, if you've got a prayer request you wrote down, put in the, we'll pray over that. We're a praying church, got a praying staff, praying eldership. Anyway, uh, we meet to pray and to discuss ministry stuff. And, and one of the things I, I ran by them was I was thinking about showing up in ratty jeans and a t-shirt for Christmas, you know. And uh, I decided not to do that. And the reason I decided not to do that is because, honestly, I was concerned that for a couple of people, the worship service would be ruined. And I love you. I don't want to ruin it for you. you know? But honestly, Christmas, <laughs> when it first happened, was a Ratty Jeans t-shirt event. You know that, right? You know, it was a guy with a carpenter's belt. He had calluses that thick. And, you know, with the first Christmas, they didn't dress up all that much. You know, the first Christmas was an event in a barn. You know, they, they didn't go to a fancy building. The people in the fancy building wouldn't let them in. You know, and, and of course, we don't know when it was. I, I know that. But that first event, when the Christ was born, we love pomp and circumstance. We love things that, that are visible. How many people who are beautiful get ahead in life compared to people who are aesthetically challenged? I mean, the, the people who carry a little bit of extra weight, like I do, you know, you don't think we know? You know, the, this world, it is so easy for us to get caught up with the way things look, with the way things seem. I don't... I think that the reason that many people dress up to come to church is because they want to offer God their very best. But I think also one big reason that a lot of people dress up to come to church is because they don't want to get attacked or hurt by other people. Putting on the best clothes is a defensive measure. It makes you look good. You cleaned up the outside, and that way nobody can see what you really are. So many churches are actually the least transparent places you'll ever go in the world. Because people have cleaned up the appearances. And like Jesus would say to the Pharisees, it's a clean pot on the outside, but what's on the end there? Yeah, that's a really whitewashed wall, but it's a tomb inside. As long as we focus on appearances, we're going to start running into trouble. Maybe I should have worn the jeans. Maybe it would have made the point a little better. So often we look at what things look like. And have you ever met a shiny plastic Christian? The ones that, the, oh, they, they really look great. Have you ever been a shiny plastic Christian? You know what it's like when you, you, you have that hectic morning and you, you pile into the car because you're late? You know, And the whole way there, you're chewing on each other and you're mad, and you're upset with each other, and you open the door, and hi. Hello, brother. Good to see you. And the kids are watching you walk in, and they're going, wasn't he just, like, foaming at the mouth at me? <laughs> you know? But you look good, right? How do we see things? 
And what is really, truly important? Is it important that we wear ties? I hope not, because most of you aren't. Uh, is, it, is it important that we, that we clean up? That we look good on the outside? What's really important? And what is this birth of Christ thing really about? How do we keep Christmas? Because I will suggest that most of us are keeping Christmas. Most of us are celebrating. Uh, anybody got a tree in your house? Weirdo. Why are you doing that? And Christmas is weird. You know, the Maxine from Hallmark's greeting card says, Christmas is weird. It's the only time of year that we, that we put a tree in our house, a dead tree in our house, and we eat candy out of our socks. It's weird, man. You know, we will be very comfortable with a sanitized Christmas that focuses on that guy. Have you noticed this? America is very comfortable with a sanitized Christmas that focuses on that guy. You know, we'll even let maybe God into the picture a little bit, maybe a little bit of peace on earth. But if you look at what our folks are doing, what our whole country is doing, you know, look at the, the movies we really love, and we watch them every year, right? It's a Wonderful Life. That's a religious movie. It's got an angel in it, right? And it's, a, it's about the angel earning his wings, and it's, it's about the importance of human life and God's great gift. It's a great Christmas movie. There's not a lot of Jesus in that one. Or how about a Christmas story? I think that's my favorite, you know, with little Ralphie, you know, and the bull, and dressed up like this, you know, and the, you'll shoot your eye out. Are you familiar with a Christmas story? There is less Jesus in that one than in It's a Wonderful Life. This, this religious holiday that we're celebrating is increasingly becoming a government holiday. You know, the, and, and this has been a cry against it for years and years and years. The, the, keep the reason for the season in mind. And remember Jesus at this time of year. But, but folks, do you feel it? Is it just me? Is it, does it seem like this guy is supplanting the main reason for this thing? There's something wonderful about thinking about the birth of Jesus Christ. Something amazing happens to us when we set our hearts and our minds there. We transform from people who pay attention to appearances to, to people who pay attention to the appearance. Let me first begin with what it is that God came to deal with. Before we start talking about appearances, because there's this wonderful summary. In the, in the book of Titus, a Titus, uh, couple of passages, he talks about the appearance of God. In, uh, the, just before he does that, in Ch Titus chapter 3, verse 3, he says this, For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others, and hating one another. Golly, Paul, you're laying it on a little thick, aren't you? I don't hate anybody can't tell you how many times I've heard I don't hate anybody. There's just people I don't like a whole lot. Uh, I don't hate anybody, but you wouldn't want to spend time with them either if you knew how they treated me. I, I don't hate anybody. I've just got a lot of grudges. Uh, I don't hate anybody. I'm just, just mad at them, but I don't hate them. Hating's wrong. I hate them, though. And if we, if we look at it, we hear this, oh, that's not really me. I mean, is it? Is that me? Is that who I am? Without God every time, that's me. When I take my eyes off of God, I wander into what drives our lives. What is it that compels us, that moves us along, that keeps us going? Well, good grief in America, it's hungers, it's desires. It's labeled authenticity, being who I really am. I want to be who I am, and that means I'm going to go get what I want. That is being driven by various passions and pleasures. Passing our days in malice and envy. Yeah. Now, think about what it is that you go home and you talk to your friends or your spouse about. 
Is it the really kind word that was said to you that day? Do you talk about the great thing somebody did? Don't we most of the time go home and say, you will not believe this? Just the other day, I was, I was in Kroger, and the, the line was backed way up, and I noticed that the lady's light was off. Not Kroger, it was Ingalls. Uh, anyway, there's no Krogers here. I was in Ingalls, and I noticed the lady's light was off. So I, I went to the manager, and I, I told, told him, you know, uh, I heard the baggers tell her that her shift's over, but her line's backed way up. You know, and but people are going to keep joining that line, and I, I just wanted to let you know. I I don't know if you and he he yelled at me. He's like, it's just for her holiday, and she knows where she's going to. And I'm like, wow, that's how you treat me. How do you treat her? I'm glad I do not work here. And I, you know, I walked home with my blood pressure a little bit elevated, and I told Ashley all about it, didn't I, hun? Yeah, talked about it for a while. Why? Because I'm full of malice. Yeah, but I don't hate that guy. <laughs> I'll tell you where he worked if you really want to know. <laughs> malice. It just creeps up in me. Is that what we're supposed to... And if you pay attention, not to what you think you think, but how you behave. When you take your eyes off Jesus, isn't that it? Doesn't this happen to us? This is why He came. To save us. Hear the beautiful... You know, I'm sorry, I, I already did that, but I'll do it again. God moves, from, moves us from appearances where we pay attention to the way things look to His appearance among us, which is what rescues us. The real reality that saves us. And He helps us to put our focus and our attention there. And I'll tell you, if you put your focus and your attention there, it fades from here. Because look at what He did. But when the goodness and the loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, it comes as us as the thing that startles us. And we're so familiar with it. It's been around for 2,000 years, which is longer than most of us have been here. And it's been here all this time, so we've lived with it our whole lives. But let it startle you again. The wonder of what He did. This is totally unexpected. Omnipotent God. The Word of God forgetting language. Having to learn again how to speak. The, the mighty God becoming frail and small and tiny and needing to be protected. It is so startling. So unexpected. And what is it? It is the goodness and the loving kindness of God come among us in the flesh. And He saved us. He saved us from what we would be without Him. Not because of works of righteousness, works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy. We didn't earn this. We didn't cause this to happen. We didn't deserve this. Hear the Gospel. You don't have to. You don't earn God's love. You receive it. You don't earn your salvation. It's given to you. And it comes in the appearance of this babe that comes among us to be our Savior, to be the one who rescues us. It comes all unexpected. Remember what was on that, pre on that previous slide, all that ugliness? Do you remember this? That's when He came. When we were still wrapped up in that mess. When we would hate Him, and He knew we would, He would use our hatred as the means of our salvation. He knew we would pound the nails in, and that's what He used to save us. It's an amazing God. Setting our hearts upon His appearing helps us to participate in what God is doing in us. When we take our eyes off of appearances, and especially, especially off of our own appearance, to which we pay so much attention. We want things to be just right. We want to be seen just this way. We want to be understood this way. We want to be admired and looked up to and respected. And we want to be adored. We take our eyes off of that and we place it on Him. Suddenly we begin to participate in, some, in becoming something that we don't have to generate that it's done to us. 
We become participants in what's being done to us. And so instead of organizing and arranging the shelves and get everything looking just right, no, no. No, we're transformed from the inside out. It says, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all people. There is nobody past this. Nobody beyond this. Because it's not human grace. It's the grace of God. It's the welcome of God. It's the generosity of God. It's God saying, come near to me and I will help you to maintain your dignity. I will provide your dignity for you. You showed up at the party and you had a t-shirt on and everyone else is in a tux. But I tell you what, i got a tux in the closet. I'm going to go get it and give it to you. I'm going to maintain your appearance. In fact, I'm going to transform your appearance by my grace. It is in God's grace that we stand and live and move and have our being. He provides for us the good people that we are. Goodness doesn't come from us. Goodness knows it's not in me. It comes from the grace of God. The gracious God who saves us from what we would be without Him. And He appeared to do it. He came among us to do it. And what does it do? Training. His coming among us is not something that we just sit around. He comes as coach. He comes as guide and leader and trainer. He, he comes as... Uh, what, uh, what's the guy's name in Rocky? The, the old grizzly guy. You know? Mick. He comes... Well, probably not as Mick. Uh, he comes in that role, though. He comes both to pour His strength into us and also to lead us into something that we wouldn't be doing if it weren't for Him. We'd be sitting on the couch, but He comes as our trainer to train us to renounce ungodly and worldly passions. Those things that would drive us if we let them. He comes and says, let, let me help you put that down. Let me put, help you to put your eyes somewhere else. Let me help you to focus on something. Let's go do this instead. I'm going to train you to renounce that and instead to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. Why? Isn't it wonderful when you have self-control? You don't even think about self-control until you encounter self out of control. You know, Until the sin comes, the stronger than you are. And really you notice that you had self out of control after it's done after it's over, when you rise and realize the regrettable words have come out of your mouth again, when you realize that you've done the thing that you swore you wouldn't do, and you've done it again. <sighs> but when He comes and He trains us to control ourselves so that when our anger flares up, it doesn't flare out. But we control it. We calm it down. When our lust gets going, it doesn't drive us to do the regrettable deed. We overcome it. By the training He has provided to us, the strength that He has given to us, we have self-control. We are able at the moment of temptation to say, no, I'm going to go on this way of escape that He's provided for me so that I can live a life that I don't regret. Nobody lives regretting a godly life. Nobody ever says, man, I was so merciful, I can't believe it. I'm so ashamed of my kindness, I cannot stand that. Nobody does that. You don't ever regret a godly life. And in this present age means in the real world in which we live that is full of so much that is not of God. So much that will pull us to things that are nothing like Him. We live in this present age saying no to those things and saying yes to God, and we become amazing. I know, I've met some of you. You're amazing. You're amazing works of God. And we wait for the blessed hope. The appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise God. Come soon. It is for His first appearing that trains us to live lives waiting for the second. There are people who will say, you know, I don't want to live with my head in the clouds. You know, I don't want to think about dreams. 
You know, I want to be a realist and be here and now. I'm going to tell you right now, if you don't put your head a little bit into the next word, world, you will miss this world. It is only the people who think toward what this world could be who participate in the will be already. When we set our hearts and minds towards what's coming, we begin to live as citizens of that great reality and this messed up one. It's how we do it. And so we live our whole lives marked by this holy waiting, this earnest desire, this yearning for Him to come back, to come again. Because even though, even though Jesus, You are doing so much good in me, and I am not what I would be, I am not yet what I will be. And I groan for it. Am I the only one? I long for a time when I will never say a harsh word. I long for a time when I am set free from ungodly hungers. I long for a time when I will be able to forgive what won't be done to me anymore because nobody's doing that anymore. But if it did happen, I'd be able to forgive it right away. I long for that. To be freed from the struggle against sin. And so I live... You know, you may have noticed in all of my prayers, out of the end, Come soon, Lord Jesus. This is why. Because His glory is coming, and when the glory comes, we share in it. We become it. We also will be glorified by our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He has come, and so it sets our hearts aflame, longing for Him to come again. And in the meantime, we live remembering Him. We remember His coming and we remember what He did. He gave Himself for us. And we immediately think of the cross. I tell you, think of the manger as well. You know that, that before He was born, He had consciousness. Only person that's ever had that. He existed before He lived in the flesh. And He chose to enter that life. Not just any life. He came as a poor man among poor people, among deposed kings. He lived in ruined royalty. He lived in a spoiled existence. He cho Not spoiled like silver spoon in the mouth. I mean spoiled like bad milk. He lived poor. And he lived among the poor. Why? Because he was giving himself. And everything that he did, he did to give himself for the sake of our redemption. Because what does our redemption look like? It looks like him. When we focus our eyes on him and say, I want to be like that too. We begin to live into our, and to experience redeemed life. This transformed, wonderful way of life that only comes from Him. And it sets us free from all lawlessness to purify for Himself a people of His own possession. You belong to Him. You belong with Him. He belongs with you. We are His people. He is our God. And He longs to dwell among us. We belong to Him. He bought us at the price of His own blood. Who are zealous. Zealous for what? Religion? Zealous for, for making sure that everything looks good? Zealous for a good appearance? Zealous for a good appearance in everybody so if somebody else doesn't have it, you look down on them? Thank you, Jeremy. That's correct. Zealous for good works. And what are good works? Well, most of the time you won't notice you're doing them. Even though you have this zeal, because it's, it's actually a zeal to be a particular kind of person. To be a person who loves. And love will act. Period. You know, if it's love, then it does something. Love isn't about having a nice, sweet feeling in our hearts. And it's not about paying attention to appearances, despite what Hollywood and every romance novel ever written will tell you. Love is not about that. Love is about loving kindness. It is about doing good works. When you love someone, you're good to them, period. And this is what He came to produce. A people who do good, who speak kindness, who speak encouragement, who feed the hungry, who clothe the naked, who care for the poor, who welcome the stranger. This is the works of love. 
And as we follow Him, this fire burns within us looking for the opportunity to do that kind of thing. This is why He came. And the truth is, Oh, you can't see it because the font changed to white instead of black. There's a text box there. But the truth is, when you look at his appearance, you tend to stop looking at appearances. When your eyes focus on Jesus Christ, then you start caring about people's hearts, not their genes. You start caring about people and and their needs. Not whether they're the kind of person who would ruin your reputation if you spent time with them. You start caring about people. Because that's what He does. As we set our eyes on Jesus Christ and we become attentive to Him, then we become inattentive to other things. It's it's an interesting reality. You're going to choose to pay attention to one way of using the word appearance. I've done some equivocation here in this sermon. Use the word appearance in two different ways. You're going to pay attention to one appearance and not the other. If you focus your eyes on the way things look, you will miss the appearance of God. If you focus your eyes on the appearance of God, the way things look will not be important to you. What will be important is the way things truly are. And as you see Jesus, then you won't see appearances, you'll see people. And you'll see people who need love, just like you do. And that is our salvation. God has appeared among us. He has come among us. And He has saved us, not because of what we've done, but because of the wonder of who He is. Church, let us focus our eyes on Him. He will lead us to become such loving, kind people. And and isn't He doing that? You look into your own life today, isn't He doing that? The more attentive you are to Him, is it not true, the better you become? Isn't that wonderful? But if you look into your heart today and you don't see that, you look into your heart today and you, and you, you see, I'm, I'm not very zealous for being good. I'm not very... We want to pray for you. Because following Jesus is the best way of life that there is. And when we focus our eyes on Him, it'll happen to you. If you need the prayers of the church, we'll pray for you. It may be that you came here today with something going on in your heart that has nothing to do with what I've talked to you about. But, but you need the care and the compassion of your siblings. Well, if you need that, let us know. We want to pray for you. And if you're not a Christian, I've said it several times, there's no better way of life than following Jesus. Follow Him. Today's a good day to start. If you're subject this morning to the invitation of God, won't you come right now while we stand and sing? I am not alone.